Good morning. Listen, God is good. Amen. At a time when Malone University was struggling for leadership and in an economic uh, difficult uh, time that all of us know about because we've been going through it, Malone was looking for um, leadership that could make a difference. And God was good to us and brought us a man by the name of Dr. David King, who is uh, a man who loves God, loves his family, loves Christian higher education, is a sought-after speaker, and we extended an invitation to him to come to Malone University to be the president, and he accepted, and we're glad. David King, would you come and greet the congregation this morning? Welcome. Thank you, Tom. It is a pleasure for Winnie and I to be here today, only in small part because of what we see outside these windows. Um, it's great to be in Florida, even when we have a lot of rain. Amen. Uh, and back in Canton, it was minus nine at some point this week, and we were here, and that's all good. But we are so grateful, again, for this privilege. Uh, it has been a pleasure for, for me to get to know Pastor Tom as a member of our Board of Trustees and appreciate his perspective, his wisdom, and leadership and then a chance to get to know Scott as well uh, in this past year serving on a search committee. So there are connections, many of them. We also appreciate your hospitality. Uh, several weeks ago, you met several of our all-stars, the, the people that really matter at Malone University, our students, and we are so proud of them. And Winnie and I count it a deep privilege to serve at Malone at such a time as this, and it is such a time as this. I'd like to take one minute to say just a word about the relationship between Christian higher education and the church in the biggest sense, but also Malone University and a place like Morningside. I like to think of that relationship very simplistically. The church is about proclamation and discipleship. A Christian university is about exploration and discipleship. I like that because it does suggest there is a difference about those two institutions. But we don't stop with our differences. We focus on our shared and common ground, which is the life of our student, your young men and women and our students, and it's discipleship. And it's within that discipleship that there is that difference at Malone, where we are really about not just preparing that student, but preparing that student for the vocation of life to live a life well in a way that glorifies God. And that's what we're about. And we so appreciate your partnership in that in all manner of ways, first and foremost, with your prayers. So thank you for your investment of prayers in the life of our students, that their time at Malone matters for the kingdom. And do pray for us during these incredibly turbulent times. Uh, turbulent economically, turbulent culturally, uh, the challenges that our students have in today's world, we want to prepare them to navigate this world well for the glory of God. So thank you again. It is a pleasure to be here, and we look forward to meeting many more of you. Let's talk about students for a minute. Sure. sure. Some of our students are at Malone. That, that's right. And we're excited about that. We are too, and we've enjoyed meeting them. Uh, I'm going to try to go for a couple names. Uh, Emily, I know, plays soccer, mm -hmm. uh, and she it's a delight to have her there and involved in a variety of ways. Uh, and by the way, I've been reminded by Chris Abrams, who was here several weeks ago, to make sure that either in this service or the next, I connect with a future student, Megan. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So uh, I'm, I'm calling you out, Megan, either this <laughs> service or next service. But uh, we, uh, Malone is large and complex in some ways, but small enough. Mm -hmm. that Wynn and I have many opportunities to really engage students on an individual and small group level yes. in our home and in other ways. And again, that's where it Amen. matters most. Amen. Yeah. Someone may need to send a 911 to Megan. I think she was in service last night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But let's, I, I want to ask you one other thing sure. before I let you sure. off the hook this sure. morning. You yeah. didn't know I was going to no, do I that. had no idea. Yeah, so. yeah. But uh, y when we talk about students, say something to the congregation about the difference between a student, what, what the student looks like today compared to 20 or 25 years ago. Wow, yeah. That's what, a, what we struggle with yep. in Christian higher education and actually 
it, it's something that we struggle with right here at Morningside in sure. our K to 12 school as sure. well. Sure. Yeah. Great question. I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is the the vast uh, breadth, and I'm going to say breadth, not depth. The breadth of things that our students have been exposed to, are aware of, in our culture and in our society before they get to Malone. And so we have to be very cognizant of that mm -hmm. and be responsive over time. How do we meaningfully, meaningfully engage that 18, 19, 20 year old student when they're coming to us from such a different place? One very small example of that is the ways in which in just in recent years that we've really made some changes to our requirement for chapel attendance. We haven't reduced that requirement, but we've developed ways programmatically to offer our students much, a much broader range of opportunities so they are meaningfully engaging community worship in ways that are meaningful to them. But, but what they come to us with in terms of that exposure, that breadth of exposure, is mind-boggling at times. Different delivery systems. That's right. Or different receptors. That's, <laughs> exa that's exactly right. And that yeah. only has in part to do with technology, and of course that's one, one piece of the equation. So it has really changed. It really has. Plus, yeah. the um, average age of a college student um, may not be 18-year-old freshman anymore. That's right. That's right. In fact, the majority of students enrolled in higher education no longer look like, like what we still call their traditional student. Mm -hmm. We are still using that language, but frankly, that language is outdated. There, there almost is no such thing as a typical college student. And so that has to do with delivering a lot of other right. things. And just, if I might, one of the ways we challenge our faculty is to think about the new ways in which we have to engage our students so that even though they may not be with us full-time, residentially over a four-year period, which is that historical model, even if they're not with us in that kind of model, that we are still, in whatever model it is, transforming their life for the good of the kingdom mm. and society. That's what we do, and so we have to do that in new ways. So you have to think outside the box, we outside do. that traditional box, yep. to be able to continue to engage these students. That's right. Would you think that the same thing might be true for the local church? Uh, <laughs> we should have known where he was going. <laughs> a absolutely. 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 Yeah. No question about it. And, and what we're talking about doesn't just have to do with 18-year-olds. Right. Uh, our 18-year-olds today are our leaders tomorrow. Uh, and, and what that looks like, uh, we can only imagine. But thank goodness, it's Amen. in better hands than ours. As uh, long as we keep the focus on Jesus. Amen. He'll take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. That's right. God bless you. Thank you for thank being you here so much. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, okay. Tom. Great to have you. want to encourage you to take time to uh, meet Dr. King and Winnie uh, after service. They'll be here, and you can visit with them and find out more about Malone University, more about uh, what they do there, and I really encourage you to do that. Now, last week, we were talking about Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gave—I'm just reviewing for a moment. Jesus gave us the keys— to success in the Christian life. So you can call it keys to success, or you can say the demands of discipleship are mainly three. And then we said, here are those three demands. That which you must give up, so there's a subtraction of something that's hurting us or weighing us down that we need to get rid of in order to get to the place we want to be. And Jesus actually put it in this language, deny yourself, and I put it in the language, give up. And then there's that which you must take up. And Jesus put it in the language of take up your cross, and I put it in the language of take up a serious uh, commitment to following Jesus as a disciple, a learner. And I said that, that it might mean that we take up the Christian lifestyle and pray or take up the Christian lifestyle and seriously read God's Word and even suggested that we might, all of us, read through the New Testament in the next 12 months. Wouldn't be very difficult to do that. Matter of fact, if you get on the city, if we talk about the city enough, you will use it, amen? If you get on the city, 
you will find a uh, Bible uh, reading plan. You'll find the Bible there in the left margin. You can click it, open it, read it anytime you want. But it also has Bible reading plans. And one of those plans is to read through the New Testament in 12 months. So if you want an easy way to do that, just get on the city, read through the New Testament. We'll do it together. Lots of people have already started. But if we're going to be serious followers of Jesus, we need to know his word. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, um, Jesus told John to eat the scroll. And I don't know about you, but when I think about just eating my Bible, it kind of makes me feel like I'm going to have indigestion. But spiritually speaking, we should be digesting the Word of God. And so that was one of the challenges last week. And then, of course, we said all of this is possible. Those are past completed actions, take up, give up. And then Jesus said, present tense, follow me. Okay, so... As I was going through this week, someone said to me, Pastor, one of the things that God has said to me is that I need to learn, um, memorize books of the Bible. And I said, really? And, and this individual said, yes, and I already have one of them memorized. And I said, wow, that's really great. And uh, then it just was like a light went off, and I said, you need to do that in church. And so I want you to meet Fawn Kinsley today. Fawn, come on up. Yeah. Okay, is your mic turned on? I think so. Oh, there it is. Good. Excellent. Um, Fawn, up until two years ago, had never opened a Bible, correct? Correct. And so, you know, lots of us, we go through life and we, we can't imagine that there are people that haven't heard about Jesus or they've never, ever opened a Bible, but um, you're one of those Living folks. Proof. Yes. So you opened the Bible. What happened? It changed my life. God spoke mm. to me through his word. Amen. And so, as you're reading his word, he spoke to you, and how, how, did it, how did it change you? I'm a completely different person than I was two years ago. I mean, it's like a 180. I, I'm mm -hmm. so thankful for the changes he's made. Um, he's brought believers into my life. I have a whole new lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, new friends and family, and um, I'm just so thankful for, Amen. for Jesus. So you committed your life to Christ, became a Christian, and you've actually seen some miracles in, the, in this short time that yes. we're talking he about. Yes, I was blessed to go to Israel with Pastor Tom mm -hmm. in 2012. That was a huge mm -hmm. blessing. My grandson was born in Stockholm, where, where my son lives, and I was blessed to be there to see his birth. At the right time. <laughs> At the right time. Through yes. some changes that were beyond your control, right? Exactly. It was uh, a yeah. miracle. Yeah. <laughs> so God was able to do what we couldn't. Exactly. Uh, that's he so did. good. Yes. So. This morning, I've asked you not to recite the entire book of James. <laughs> <laughs> you are also now working on um, First John. First John. First okay, John. <laughs> so we have James complete, and we're working on First John. But this morning, um, would you do James chapter one? Yes. Okay, <laughs> everyone, listen. Okay, um, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. 
Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't do this last night. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so someone asked me this question, and I, I think I actually know the answer, but when you're reciting, you know exactly which verse you're on, correct? I so if, if you're on 17, you could tell us, or 18, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Thank, God, yeah. Thank you so much Thank for inspiring us. God Thank bless you. you. So, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> you know, not everyone will do what Fawn does, but she's doing what she's doing in obedience to what she believes God asked her to do. And I, I believe that God asks us many times to do things, and we look at what God asks us to do, and we use this word, impossible. And so we fail to do those things, and we miss a blessing. We should always remember that with God, oh, excellent, all things are possible. And so we may not memorize whole books, but we can very easily memorize principles that God gives us to live by. We can very easily remember what a book in the Bible is about so that if we need to um, read about something, we can go there and find it. There are things that we do remember that are very important. And all of us can memorize Scripture. I just said maybe not all of us will do what Fawn did. I knew a man a long time ago. His name was Percy Trueblood, and he was known as the Walking Bible. I never heard him do it, but it was said that he could quote the Bi Bible uh, word for word, Genesis to Revelation. And uh, he, it, he was the father of uh, Vanjie Berry, who was a longtime attender and member here at Morningside. So um, people do memorize God's Word. Now today you have your Bibles. Turn to John chapter 17. There's, there, there will be five 
uh, short notes that will come up on the screen. They're short and limited because we want you to use your Bible, not be dependent on what's on the screen. So those are just to be, give you the, the markers and the rest you write right there in your Bible so you have it with you all the time. Amen? John chapter 17, verse 1. This is, this is a, a paraphrase of what it says. Jesus looked to heaven and he prayed. That's pretty descriptive, right? We know, we know exactly what he's doing. We can, we can see it in our mind's eye. He looked to heaven and he prayed. And when we read John chapter 17, one of the things that we find out is this is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. It's his prayer for the church. And it's his prayer for all believers that are going to come after him. And when I read this prayer, one of the things that jumps out is the heart of Jesus. It shows us his heart. It shows us what's really important to him. It shows us what his passion is. And when you get an idea of what his heart is and his passion, the second thing that I, I get for me is it gives me hope. So John chapter 17, Jesus lifting his head to heaven. He shows us his heart, and that gives us hope. Because everything he prays about is something that the Father in heaven will do. Now, lots of times we need things and we wonder, will God do this? Will God do that? Will God hear my prayer? Will God answer my prayer? Well, there are at least certain things that we are told very clearly in the Bible that God will do this. And so this morning, as we continue to enter into 2014, can't believe that we're almost halfway through the month. It seems impossible. But there, here we are. So we're, we're trying to get ourselves together so that we are focused and have a plan for 2014. And this passage of Scripture actually shows us that Jesus is praying. I think he's praying in heaven for all of us right this very moment. And there are five things in this passage that we need in 2014 if we're going to be able to give up, take up, and live up to Jesus, follow him. And remember, no spiritual navel-gazing. Remember, we're not looking at what other believers are doing. We're looking at Jesus. That's why he said, follow me. He didn't say, follow the person beside you. Amen? And he said to his own disciples, don't worry about what they're doing. Follow me. And, and he meant that. Okay, here we go. Number one, what does Jesus pray? In verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. We need protection. In 2014, we need protection. First of all, we need protection in the spiritual realm because the Scripture tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against powers and principalities of the air that we cannot see, and they are stronger than we are. And so Jesus is very clear Father, protect them from the evil one. And I want you to notice, by the way, he's not saying put them in a bubble so nothing can touch them. All he is doing is saying while they're in this world, and here we are, right? We're in this world, sometimes painfully so, sometimes joyfully so, but here we are. And so Jesus says keep them safe in the world. He didn't say take them out of the world. They're in the world. He said, keep them safe. Help them in this imperfect world to be able to follow me. And that's a very important prayer. What Jesus is doing, he realizes we're preparing for eternity. So I'm going to get to this at the end, but our ultimate goal is to get to heaven. Amen? I, you know, I, only a few times in my life have I had people tell me that they're going to the other place, hell, and they don't care. And um, it, it's pretty startling when that happens. But I'm just going to say, most people, even if they think they may be going to hell, don't want to go there. They want to go to heaven. And so we need protection on this journey because we're preparing for an eternity with Christ. And every one of us in this room need number one. And Jesus prayed it for us. And when he asked the Father, it is something that God will do for us. So start praying for your protection in 2014. And then this is what Jesus said on top of that. He said, give them unity. Verse 21. 
my prayer for all of them is that they will be of one heart and one mind, just as you and I, Father, are one. Unity. Now, unity is a tricky thing, but that's the kind of relationship that he wants us to have together. He doesn't want us to be apart. He wants us to be together. And he wants it to be as close as he and the Father are. That's very close. One heart, one mind, one spirit, okay? And so he wants us in the church to be very close. And so if we're going to be that close, we have to stop looking at what we're doing, what each other's doing, and start looking at Jesus. Amen? I, I read this week, it, it was kind of amusing to me. There's a, a Democratic Congress uh, woman and a Democratic congressman, U U U.S. Congress. And they were working on a project together, and it was very tense. And then they said, but we had a bonding experience. And I thought, wow, this will be good. I, I want to see what bonded a Democrat and a Republican in the United States Congress together. And they said, we, we, we found that we had a common interest in the Seattle Seahawks. And the more we talked about our common interest in the Seattle Seahawks, the more we found that we liked each other. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, if the Seattle Seahawks could bring a Democrat and a Republican together, what could happen if they could just get a common interest in Jesus? Woo. But yet, it's almost illegal to talk about Jesus, so they talk about the Seahawks. Okay, never mind. That was a political remark. Moving on. Imagine what could happen if we could bond together through our common interest in Jesus. Taking our eyes off of those things that we sometimes have trouble agreeing on and probably always will till Jesus comes and we should get over it and focus on what we do agree on that Jesus loved us he gave his life he paid it all all to him we owe sin had left its crimson stain he washes us white as snow he brings us together Jesus prayed for that unity and it's possible for us to have that because remember He's not asking the Father to do anything that the Father is not going to do. We're talking about loving each other unconditionally. That's Christian unity. We're talking about endurance toward the goal and perseverance toward the goal. And when we all have our eyes set on the goal, we're going to be unified in achieving what God wants us to achieve. And so I just... I challenge you to pray for God's protection. You need it. I challenge you to pray that God will give you peace in your heart so that you can have unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the third thing that Jesus said is they need joy. I posted this week both on Facebook book and on The City um, just a short thing about the top 10 New Year's resolutions according to Google. And then I posted right with that um, the uh, 10 resolutions that a pastor friend of mine wrote that were very good and so I thought I'm just going to let everybody read the contrast between the Google New Year's resolutions and the, the, the Christian uh, New Year's resolutions and one of those on, on the Christian side was that Christians need to laugh more We need to look less serious and more hopeful. We, we, need to, we need to be able to have joy in the midst of the storm. And, and, and Jesus said, give them joy. Let them have joy that, that passes understanding. Let them have joy that su supersedes the circumstances. Let them have joy that overcomes. And so this is what Jesus said in verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I pray these things while I am still in the world so that these followers can have all of my joy in them. 
Why was Jesus joyful? He was joyful because his mission was going to be completed. He was joyful because he had been obeying what the Father asked him to do, and he was seeing the fruits of that. He was joyful because he knew that there was going to be a victory. Even though there would be some pain, he was able to go to the garden and say, not my will, but yours. And, and he was able to walk to the cross because he knew there was going to be a great victory through his sacrifice and his resurrection. It would be a joyful moment. And so he said, I want them to have all of my joy in them. So here's the question, 2014. Are you praying that for yourself? That you would have the joy of the Lord? Are you praying that you would have the joy that lasts forever? Never dies. Oh, listen, the world has a word that's fickle. The world has a word that's, that we use as happiness. And happiness doesn't last, but joy does. Because the source of joy is God. The source of happiness for us is if our husband or our wife does what we want them to. The source of happiness for us is if we get the right car that we want to drive or we have the house that we want to live in or we have X amount in our account in the bank. You understand what I'm talking about? And when that account gets depleted, we get depressed. We don't have joy anymore because our hope is not founded on the proper person or thing. And so we lose joy because it depends on us and and. So happiness is really only as good as your next fix. And I'm not talking about alcohol or drugs or anything. I'm talking about sometimes our next fix is a relationship. Sometimes our next fix is a, a new vehicle or the latest and greatest whatever it is that came out on the market. I mean, I know people that get depressed because they don't have the newest iPhone. And I'm, I'm like, really, what does that new iPhone do that the old one doesn't do but until they get the new iPhone, their happiness went away. Okay? Jesus said, we need something more than that. We need joy that lasts forever. And he asked the Father to be sure that we had it. Then he prays for purity. Give them purity. Wow. Remember, something we give up, then the positive, something we take up. And after we have completed those two actions, we actively follow Jesus. This is what he says in verse 17. Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. Sanctify them by truth, I think King James says, your words are truth. Oh, what did Fawn tell you just a little bit ago? She told you that the Word of God has changed and is changing her life. Truth that cleanses and purifies, oh, I use that old word, and sanctifies truth. And what she's doing is she's replacing error from before Jesus She's replacing error with truth, and it's changing her. And so God's Word gives us strength to keep our minds focused on the right things. Are we going to be perfect? Listen, none of us are perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. But Jesus wouldn't have prayed this prayer if our minds couldn't focus more and more and more Day by day, more on him. It's a heart. It's a perfect heart. My heart always wants to do what God wants me to do. Once in a while in the flesh, I fail, but because I have God's word in me, it's purifying me and perfecting me. And in that failure, I'm convicted, and I get up running toward Jesus again. Amen? Titus chapter 1, verse 15 says, A person who is pure of heart sees goodness and purity in everything. 
But a person whose own heart is evil and untrusting finds evil in everything. For his dirty mind and rebellious heart color all he sees and hears. I, I read that verse for you because I think it's a perfect picture of what we experience as we walk day by day in life. We come in contact with people, and lots of those people see good things. They see only the good things, and they're not focusing on the negative. But some people just, they can't seem to help themselves. They just see darkness. And that's why we need the Word of God active in our lives. He says, give them purity. Your Word is truth, and that truth is the purity that we need. So we, that we give up the junk, and we put in the truth that changes us. Here's the last one. Got to finish. Father, they need a mission. Hmm. Same thing he did with his disciples. They were discouraged and kind of confused. And and in Matthew chapter 28, he said, wow, I better hurry up and give them a mission or they're going to fall apart. And so he said, go into all the world and make disciples and preach the gospel to all people and all nations everywhere and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. A mission. What's your mission? God, give them a mission. That's what he wants in our lives, a mission. He wants us to let people know how much he loves them. That's why Jesus, when he was asked, what, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Matthew chapter 22. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, if you keep these, you have kept all of the law. Wow, that's pretty simple, isn't it? So listen, our mission, love God, love people, and make sure that everybody we come in contact with knows how much God loves them. Now, this was really important to Jesus. In verse 18, he said, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. And in verse 23, he said, then the world will know that you sent me and that you love them just as much as you loved me. In other words, by their love and passion for the world, that they're going to see how much God loves them. And they're also going to see how much God loves those disciples that are speaking to them at that very moment. He said this six times. I want the world to know that I, Jesus, was sent by God. Don't you think if the world knew and understood that Jesus was sent by God and actually was God? If there were more people telling other people in the world that very message, don't you think more people would be listening? I, they, they, they might not receive it, but at least they would pay attention. People go through life ignoring the fact that Jesus was sent, that he was sent into the world by God, and Jesus wants other people to know that, that he came God in human flesh, that he lived his life for us, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine, and that he resurrected for us so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. And yet people can go 60 or 70 or 80 years ignoring the fact that God loves them. So our goal, our mission might be this simple to make it a point that everywhere we go, we get people to stop, to look, and to listen to what God says. The rest is up to him. It's not our job. Our job is to be the witness. He'll be the faithful evangelist. We could make it our mission to be keepers of the Great Commission in 2014, go and make disciples. We could make it our mission to be keepers of the great commandment. Love God, love people. I've met with staff all this week, and it's been exciting to hear about some of their goals and 
Pastor Mike in student ministry said, at least 50 saved this year and baptized. 20 students read through the New Testament together with me. I'd like to take 12 to Haiti on mission. I'd like to take 12 to Israel. That's mission too. It's just different. One is mission in service. Another is mission in learning more about our Savior and, and discipleship. Pastor Mike Beath said, I'd like to have 200 people who are actively involved in recovery every week. We have more than 100 right now. But imagine if we could just be honest to God and honest to ourselves and say, hey, this is who we are, and, and you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with an anger issue, and I'm going to go to recovery. Pastor Mike's getting excited right now. I think that on a social level in 2014, as we pray for protection and we pray that God gives us unity and joy and purity and, and that we fulfill his mission for us, that we would assist more families than any other church in St. Lucie County. Now, I know some of you say, that sounds a little prideful. No, it has nothing to do with pride. It has everything to do with saying we should do everything that we should do and can do and then some, trusting God. It has everything to do with saying there are more needs in this county than any one church could possibly meet. And instead of just saying we took care of a few, why not say we took, as many, we took care of as many as was humanly possible and then we went farther than that because God helped us spiritually, emotionally, comfort people, give them food, assist with finances, assist in some kind of community project that would be beneficial to children and families in this community, and have a social presence that's recognized throughout St. Lucie County in Christian circles and secular circles that says Morningside Church loves God and they really care about people. That's who we need to be in 2014. Let's pray together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to just think for a moment. Again, if there's something in the way that's keeping you from fulfilling that mission, give it up. And then take up the cure. Reading God's Word, following Jesus, more prayer discipleship, get with a Christian brother or sister in Christ that can encourage you and make you strong and determine to follow Jesus no matter what. I hope you've written these five down because we need them as a church. Protection, unity, joy, purity, and the fulfillment of a mission. Right now, we're going to turn our focus on worshiping God through giving. And yes, you may give tithes and offerings in just a moment, but more importantly, have you given yourself, your life, your hopes, and your dreams? Is Jesus first in your life? And so in a moment when I pray, Maybe some of you as Christians need to get your life refocused. Maybe there's someone here for the first time that needs to pray a simple prayer of God, forgive me. I encourage you to do that. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for this prayer that shows us the heart, the heart of God. He wants to protect us. He wants to give us unity. He wants to give us joy. He wants to bring purity into our lives that we cannot do on our own. And he wants to give us a life that has meaning and purpose in mission that will make a difference. Help us to receive that. If we've been naming you as our Savior, if we've been calling ourselves Christian, Father, and we've been walking at a distance from you, I pray today that we would close the ranks. And that we would focus on being the men and women that you've called us to be. If there's any person in this room that is here and has been 
just kind of saying, I can do this on my own. I don't really need God. It's, it's kind of a crutch. And they've realized this morning that they can't do it on their own. I pray that you would help them pray a prayer something like this. God, forgive me. I thought I could do it myself. I trusted myself. It's not working out. Things are coming unglued. And I need a Savior. And I'm asking Jesus to forgive my sin and to come into my life today. From this point on, I, I want to follow him and obey his word and fulfill the mission he has. God, I pray that you can take the pieces that I've created that have become a mess and put them back together again. I give you my life, and I ask for your help, and I thank you for forgiveness of my sin. Now, Lord, we offer ourselves and the offerings that you have enabled us to give unto you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. As you give, worship and allow God to meet you in this place. Don't forget to give us your blue cards. Help us get to know you. God bless you as you give.